This is NJTV. From the production studios of Montclair State University, this is NJTV News with Mike Schneider. Tonight, a bombshell accusation in the bridge scandal. The Port Authority official behind the lane closures claims he was carrying out the orders of the Christie administration and that the governor knew more than he's admitting. Plus, a big scare at the Super Bowl, next on NJTV News. Hello, political shockwaves going through the Garden State tonight. That's because of a letter from the lawyer for David Wildstein. He, of course, is the former Port Authority official who was behind those lane closings on the George Washington Bridge. In a letter to Port Authority officials, Wildstein, through his attorney, now says that he was acting on the orders of the Christie administration, and he claims that, and these are his words now, that evidence exists tying Mr. Christie to having knowledge of the lane closures during the period when the lanes were closed. And that is a key point. Because listen to this clip from the governor's news conference on January the 9th. Listen to where the governor appears to say he didn't know about the lane closings until after the fact. I had no knowledge of this, of the planning, the execution, or anything about it. Um, and then I first found out about it um, after it was over. Um, and even then, what I was told was that it was a traffic study. And there was no evidence to the contrary until yesterday that was brought to my attention or anybody else's attention. In essence, Wildstein, through his attorney, is basically accusing the governor of lying. And the letter also says Mr. Wildstein contests the accuracy of various statements that the governor made about him and that he can prove the inaccuracy of some. Well, tonight we received this statement just moments ago from the governor's office, so listen to this. This from the governor's office. Mr. Wildstein's lawyer confirms what the governor has said all along. He had absolutely no prior knowledge of the lane closures before they happened and whatever Mr. Wildstein's motivations were for closing them to begin with. As the governor said in a December 13th press conference, once again, this is from his statement, he only first learned lanes were closed when it was reported by the press. And as he said in his January 9th press conference, he had no indication that this was anything other than a traffic study until he heard otherwise on the morning of January the 8th. The governor denies Mr. Wildstein's lawyer's other assertions. So here basically is what we have right now. We have the letter from the lawyer from Mr. Wildstein saying essentially they have evidence linking the governor to prior knowledge of the lane closures, something the governor has said all along. And then, later in the day, we get the counter from the governor's office. Absolutely untrue. The facts from the press conferences speak for themselves. They don't know what Mr. Wildstein's motivations are. They disagree and dispute his findings. As we said at the very beginning, political shockwaves in the Garden State tonight. Our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, joins us right now. Michael, uh, I mean, we, we came to work today assuming that the Super Bowl perhaps would be the big story. We knew that the story was developing, but this is something of a bombshell. This is a bombshell, Mike, um, and it's hard to figure out the dimensions of it. When you first hear about it and you first hear that Wildstein and his lawyer, Alan Zegas, have put out a le letter saying the governor wasn't telling the truth, you think, oh, my goodness, uh, this is the end for Chris Christie. But then w the more you look at what the Alan Zekas letter actually says and then you hear what the governor's office says in reply, uh, they might not be that far apart. The, 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 uh, is it the, lawyer language that we're talking yeah, well, about here? The, uh, as everybody's pointing out, this three-page letter from Zegas is uh, mm -hmm. very carefully worded. But uh, Zegas and Wildstein are saying the they have evidence that the governor knew about it during the lane closures, which were from Monday to Thursday. Christie, in the soundbite we just played, said uh, he only learned about it afterwards. I think elsewhere in his press conference, he said he became aware of it during. Well, through news if, accounts. Through news said, accounts. Yeah, right. But if they're only that far apart, if, uh, if he learned about it when it ended on a Friday and Wildstein says, no, he knew about it on a Wednesday, I don't know that that's an impeachable offense. Well, the other thing that's interesting in this is the claim, Wildstein's claim that uh, the governor mischaracterized several things in terms of the way he described Mr. Wildstein. All vanity aside, 
uh, Wildstein says he can prove the inaccuracy of those things as well. What are we to make of that? Well, that's not as important as what the governor knew about, mm -hmm. about the, the lane closures. What he said about Wildstein was, I was, class, I was class president and I was an athlete. He was, I don't know what he was doing, the governor said, implying we weren't such good friends. And, creating, uh, creating some separation. Michael, I'm going to ask you to hold on for a second. Senator Loretta Weinberg is on the phone right now. Uh, Senator Weinberg was, the, in, in the eyes of many, the driving force behind this, this investigation. She's the co-chair of the Select Committee now investigating uh, this situation on the bridge. Uh, Senator, what, what was your reaction when you heard this story uh, suddenly break? Well, there are further allegations in this letter that involved the governor, but they are allegations uh, made through an attorney on behalf of his client, David Wildstein, and it just proves why we need to get to the bottom of what really went on here and that people should be coming before us and telling the whole truth. And I, I, I want to point out something else. There's something else kind of interesting in the letter, and again, an allegation made on behalf of Mr. Wildstein, through his attorney, on behalf of Mr. Wildstein. And he maintains that a Port Authority attorney counseled Bill Baroni for his appearance before the Transportation Committee. And he says that that counseling went on over a period of four to five days and that Mr. Wildstein was present for most of it according to this letter. What do you make of that, Senator? Well, what I make of that is if, in fact, that allegation is true, and if, in fact, an attorney for the Port Authority counseled Mr. Baroni to give a cover-up to the Assembly Transportation Committee, I find that another very, very disturbing allegation that needs to be explored. What this letter, I think it's pretty well accepted by everybody that what Mr. Baroni came and said, not, again, not under oath and not as a result of a subpoena, but what he told the Transportation Committee was untrue. There doesn't seem to be a traffic study that was testified to by the Executive Director, Pat Foy, and there are no private lanes or roads to from Fort Lee to the George Washington Bridge. Senator, let me let me just ask this so I'm absolutely clear as to what you're actually saying here. Are you implying or stating outright that the attorney for the Port Authority would have coached or counseled Mr. Baroni to lie when he testified? I'm saying that that is an allegation in this letter. And it, to me, that's a pretty serious allegation. And I think we need to get to the bottom of it. Well, where do we go from here? I, I, at this point, I've asked you this before, and I've asked uh, Assemblyman Wisniewski, the co-chair, as well. If this investigation could lead to the governor being subpoenaed to testify, is that a possibility now? Well, the governor's office has been subpoenaed for documents. And uh, based upon what we see when those documents are due on Monday or beyond, I'm, I'm not sure. I know that some folks have asked for some extensions, which our attorney thought were appropriate. So I'm not sure exactly what's going to come in on Monday or uh, what the attorney will be granting some extensions for. But I think we have to wait and see what's in those documents and then decide as we go ahead. But these are some carefully worded, I think, uh, allegations in this letter. And it just proves that this committee needs to forge ahead. And on behalf of the people of New Jersey, needs to try to find out what the truth of this whole sordid saga is. Senator Weinberg, have to leave it there. We appreciate your being available to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy Super Bowl, everybody. Indeed. There is a game coming up on Sunday. We're going to talk about, in fact, some of the uh, developments that occurred today uh, in and around the Super Bowl, some uh, criminal activity perhaps, or at least the appearance thereof in a major investigation that was launched. More on that in a couple of moments. But rejoining me right now once again is our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, and Congressman Frank Pallone as well. Uh, we'd plan to talk to you today about a number of issues, but this seems as like a good time as any to bring this up. What do you, what do you make of what you've heard today? 
Well, I certainly get the impression from the Wildstein letter or his attorney's letter that the, he is suggesting that the governor wasn't telling the truth, you know, that uh, in fact the governor did know, and, uh, and if that's the case, that, you know, that there is uh, the situation here where they're alleging that the governor didn't tell the truth, I mean, that's obviously a very serious problem for the governor. And uh, as uh, Senator Weinberg said, both the committee and the U.S. attorney have to get to the bottom of it. I should point out as well, we got word late today that the U.S. Attorney's Office has now subpoenaed the city of Hoboken uh, regarding the allegations made by Mayor Don Zimmer, uh, allegations that the Christie administration had abused power, in her opinion, by demanding her approval of a development project uh, in exchange for her getting certain Hurricane Sandy uh, relief funds. Michael, you've been working the phones on, on on this story, especially the Bridgegate story, what are you hearing from the Republicans? Well, I spoke to someone, a close personal friend of Chris Christie's, who says this is ridiculous, it's outrageous, uh, this, this is so unfair what's being done to him, this has never been done to anybody else before. Um, well, what do you think is being done to I'm him? Not, I guess the media pile on, or the Democratic uh, pile on, or a combination of the two, he, he didn't specify. Um, I, I think what's uh, what's also interesting is the timing of this. Uh, you know, Wildstein and Chris. Wildstein says that he knows some things that were wrong in Christie's characterization of their relationship. Uh, Wildstein may well have been insulted by what Christie said about him, and to put this out Friday evening before the Super Bowl. Uh, Looks like it's. It, it looks like the two of them have now really diverged. We didn't know until this point until w whether Wildstein would try to protect the governor anyway. It looks like this is almost a declaration of war against the governor. Look, interesting because Wildstein's attorney Alan Siega certainly at the hearing said, "You want to hear more? Give him immunity." But the other thing, Wildstein himself is not available for comment. And Mr. Siega, you tried to call today, and where is he? I called his office about an hour ago, around a little after five, and the secretary said, oh, he's on a plane right now. So I, I guess they released the letter, and then he either went on a pre-planned vacation or decided to get away from the 30, 40 media calls coming you know, in. You know, early on, there was talk that it was the, they were looking at the Christie campaign. Now it's the administration. That's, that's different, isn't it? It is different. Uh, that, that, that's what... Uh, brought this whole thing to where it is right now, the, the Bridget Kelly connection, the, the connection into the governor's office, uh, not just something done by some rogues at the Port Authority or in the campaign. Congressman, uh, we know that uh, Senator Jay Rockefeller had talked about an investigation into the Port Authority. Uh, do you think that this will spur uh, more moves within uh, the federal government to take a look. There was there was a call on Sean Donovan to investigate some of the Hurricane Sandy funding as well. I believe you you were involved with that. I, yeah. Look, I think so. I mean, look, I, I still think that the legislative, the state legislative investigation is the most important one right now, and obviously the U.S. Attorney's investigation is the most important. But I continue to be concerned, as are some of my colleagues, over you know how this uh, Sandy money was being spent or not spent. I mean, the fact of the matter is that we still have a lot of our constituents at the shore that have not gotten their money. They're on waiting lists. They don't know what that means. They don't know what the criteria are. And we keep hearing more and more accounts of how, you know, money was going to uh, other towns or, you know, that, that uh, don't seem to be uh, Sandy related at all. Do, so. you, do you think politics is behind a lot of that? Or any of that, for I that mean, matter. there certainly are quite a few allocate, uh, you know, allegations now that Sandy money was going for projects that were not Sandy-related or not directly Sandy-related. And we have HGI, which was the, the uh, agency that managed the contract, now having been fired. We're not told at all why or who's replacing them. So, you know, a lot of people at the shore who are waiting for their checks are wondering what is going on. And that's why I asked that HUD uh, investigate HGI. Michael, uh, before we move on, uh, try to cover a little bit of what's going on with the Super Bowl and the fallout from this morning's strange, bizarre uh, incidents. Uh, Senator Lesniak has floated the word uh, impeachment today. Today. Uh, apparently, the Star-Ledger has an editorial that just came out within the past hour also saying that if these new statements are true or if the governor lied, he needs to resign or be impeached. John Wisniewski used that word impeachment three weeks ago, or two, two or two, three weeks ago, and then stopped using it as if somebody said, hey, you're going way too far too fast. 
Uh, who knows where we're, where we're headed? Well, we're headed to another week of covering this story, probably, but we'll, Weeks. We'll, we'll pause for now. Weeks indeed. Michael Aaron and Congressman Frank Pallone, thank you so much. Thank pause. you. Pause. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Don't go away. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance, and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, the Star Ledger and NJ.com, and PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. Uh, this morning, we were anticipating this day would be consumed by telling you about preparations for the Super Bowl. And then suddenly, strange, suspicious envelopes started turning up at about a half a dozen hotels in and around the Meadowlands area. The letters contained a suspicious white substance. And of course, given the history of, of uh, terrorism and the appearance of anthrax letters way back when, it raised a lot of fear. So you had various different elements of police and uh, law enforcement being called in, uh, some of the hotel areas being closed off, uh, hazmat teams responding. At this hour, we're being told that the materials found in those envelopes appears to be inert, is the word that the FBI is using. Some people said they could be baking powder. Other people said it could be cornstarch. Inert is the word that the FBI is using. But at this point, Nobody seems to know who sent them, uh, why the people who got them got them, and the entire motivation for what was a very strange day in and around the Meadowlands. Uh, joining us now is a man very, uh, very experienced in the area of counterterrorism and law enforcement, the public safety director of Jersey City, Jim Shea. Uh, appreciate you joining us once again. Uh, th you know, you've got, what, both teams staying in hotels in your town. What did this mean for you? Uh Thanks for having me, Mike. Uh, obviously, when we heard what happened at the hotels in Bergen County, we immediately put a plan into effect for our hotels here in Jersey City to make sure that any like envelopes did not arrive there. But we're thankful to say that we have not detected any to this time. Uh, your previous experience, of course, we've discussed on this program, NYPD, part of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Uh, I've been told that the, the level of security for this Super Bowl is as high as we've ever seen virtually in this country. So when something like this happens, were all of the pieces in place necessary to respond from what you've been able to glean? Did, it, did the plan work effectively? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think everybody involved can be satisfied with the response today. A response to an episode like this involves two parts. The most important and the first part is the safety of everyone concerned. And that's when the state, local, and federal actors responding together respond, take charge of these letters, and ensure that nobody has been hurt by them and that it's not a hazardous substance. Once that's determined, then it goes into the investigation phase led by the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force. And that task force also includes state, local, federal partners working together to solve these crimes. One of the interesting things that, that we noticed in the newsroom this morning was very quickly we started getting reports about what the material was or might be. Uh, it, it was, you know, by lunchtime that people were saying cornstarch or baking soda. W uh, were there special assets in place that allowed law enforcement to make that determination much more quickly than in years past? Uh, yes, there were. Uh, obviously, the Super Bowl is what they call a Tier 1 event. There are multiple assets here to handle any possible scenario. This one has been ant anticipated and planned for, just like multiple others. Uh, in addition, sadly, since 2001, which you referenced before, uh, white powder letters are a fact of life, and just about every major police department has assets to deal with them. Well, Jim Shea, we always appreciate your uh, words of wisdom and your experience. We thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mike. Always a pleasure.
It is time right now for our weekly political roundtable with Democratic strategist Brendan Gill and Republican strategist Al Gaburo. Gentlemen, welcome. Um, you know, for a political roundtable, this is about as strange a day as we've ever had on this program. As a Republican, what goes through your mind when you hear what's being said by Mr. Wildstein about the governor? Well, Mike, I've read the, the letter uh, that Mr. Wildstein um, sent to the Port Authority. Uh, actually, there's an attorney sent to the Port Authority. Um, I think it's a letter from a very good attorney who chose his words very carefully. Uh, I think when you read the letter, um, I don't think anywhere in the letter it talks about the governor having direct knowledge of anything that happened. And I think at this point, before anyone rushes to judgment, at some point the governor will address this or put out a statement. Would you like to see him do it? you know, five minutes ago? I, I'd like to see him do it immediately, and I think that's probably what's going to wind up happening because I think he, he spent two and a half hours in a press conference or two hours in a press conference, answered all the questions, and I expect him to stand by his words as, as well, being the truth. Well, in that letter, truth. Wildstein is taking issue with some of the words that were uttered at that press conference. Absolutely. Well, listen, I, I would agree with Al. I mean, I think we the governor needs to speak. We need to hear what the governor has to say. Um, you know, I think this is not a time, I'm sure, uh, a lot of folks uh, in my own party right now who might be watching this uh, would love for me to, you know, to pounce on the governor at this moment, but I don't think that's the time to do that. I think this is the time for the facts uh, to emerge and to come out. I mean, already, um, and that's why when you introduced me, Mike, I was still looking at my phone, and this story's literally mm -hmm. changing. Oh, um, by the, by you know, the moment, by, by the second. By the second and by the moment. Um, Senator Lesniak uh, has just uh, said that if these allegations are true, that uh, that the governor should be uh, impeached or impeachment proceedings should start. So, um, you know, what my point here is to say that, um, you know, we need to hear from the governor, and I think we do need to hear from the governor pretty quickly about, uh, about these allegations. When you hear words like him, I mean, this is a man who just about a month ago, it was all, is he running for president? Of course he's running for president. When does the campaign really, uh, now we're talking about whether or not he finishes out his his brand new second term. I think some people are talking about that. I don't. I don't know that. Um, uh, look, I mean, uh, Brendan uh, just said that a, a member of the legislature threw out the word impeachment. Mm -hmm. That that uh, word has been thrown out before uh, by a member of the legislature. Uh, way premature. I mean, you know, what are we really even talking about here at this point? With the information that we've got, you know, the governor has made it very clear. He will follow this story wherever it goes. They will be uh, an open book as he's been. Uh, when, when this thing broke, he took leadership, he acted. Can and he it's another step. govern like this? Can he not only be the old Chris Christie, because yeah. obviously that would be a difficult feat to replicate under most conditions considering his first year, first term in office. Sure. Can he even govern effectively? The, the answer is yes, he absolutely can. If if you look at his daily schedule, uh, especially this week, at some point maybe we can talk about how good the Super Bowl is for New Jersey. Um, but this well, week that could his, be another roundtable and another but this, debate. But, schedule, yeah. but, <laughs> but his, he's had he's kept a completely full schedule between uh, his duties as governor and between RGA chairman. The governor's kept a very full schedule through this, uh, and and I don't see any reason why he doesn't continue doing exactly what he's done. Brendan and I would have to disagree with you on that. I mean, I I think his uh, profile this week has been quiet for uh, what we know of Governor Christie. You know, I would have to. Find fundamentally disagree. Uh, I'm not ready to say he can't govern, but I will say this. This was probably supposed to be a big week, both for him politically, uh, the largest event in the world hosted in his home state. And uh, I haven't seen much or heard much from him uh, in terms of what we've become accustomed to uh, with a Chris Christie. And I think that says a lot about, uh, quite frankly, the seriousness of these allegations. Again, I think uh, what I want to say and what I think many members of my party have continued to say is that we need all of the facts to emerge. There's lots of things that have yet to be investigated. We have people still who are going to come to appear before the committee. We have potential, uh, not with the governor, but other situations where we do know that it's been reported that the U.S. attorney is investigating. So there's a lot um, yet to go, a lot of things yet to happen. And we do but know this... that Mr. Wildstein certainly, I mean, they made it no secret during his testimony before the Transportation Committee, they were shopping around for immunity. Whether this is a perhaps a ploy to try to achieve that in some way or not, we'll have to wait and see. But the, the other question I have about this is this story, it's, it's all over the network newscasts, mm -hmm. it's all over the cable newscasts, it's all over the world. And my concern or my question to you is this. Uh, does this say something about our state that ultimately hurts not only his ability to govern, but our ability to just do business as a state, mm -hmm. to attract the kind of business that he wants to attract, to, to attract the kind of tourism, to, to grow the way New Jersey's supposed to grow? I, does this hurt us? I don't, I don't think it does, Mike, and I'll tell you why. I think this is such a big story because it's about 
Chris Christie, and they've tried to make it about Chris Christie. He's wildly popular, has been wildly popular in New Jersey. He's been wildly popular across the country. He is, in many ways, my opinion, uh, would be the leading candidate for my party to be president of the United right, States. What's happening and, in the polls and now, as a result soon. of all that, uh, the story is more because it's him, not New Jersey. About 30 seconds. I think that's always been the situation with Chris Christie. It's always been about him. And I've been on this show and repeatedly have said that I think he's been the most political governor um, that we have ever had. Uh, and I think that's what you're seeing right now. There is no, uh, unfortunately, political solution. And the loser, ultimately, in the entire situation, I do believe, are the taxpayers and the constituents uh, in New Jersey who have uh, folks who are focused on issues like this and not about issues of governing. Um, so, you know, we have to wait and see. I mean, a lot more yet to come, and uh, we'll, we'll pass judgment then. All right. And on that note, we will uh, pass judgment on the week that was, and wish you a fond weekend, and we'll see you back here again Thanks, in Mike. the very near future. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And before we go, a recap of our top story that developed today. Allegations from David Wildstein, the former Port Authority official, that in fact, when he was involved in the lane closings back in September on the George Washington oh, Bridge, that he was acting on the orders of the Christie administration, and he claims that the governor knew about the lane closings as they happened. A statement from the governor's office insisting that the letter from Wildstein's lawyer actually proves what the governor said all along, that he was not involved, he had no prior knowledge of the lane closings at all, and that he stands by his statements as they were. The governor says he was not involved. That does it for us. Hope you have a great Super Bowl Sunday, and hope to see you back here once again on Monday. Till then, I'm Mike Schneider. Thank you for watching. Good night. I'm Detective Chief Inspector Barnaby. This is Detective Sergeant Troy. This is time. Miss Boxer. It's a double dose of your favorite crime-solving duos. <gasps> the investigative gardening pair, Rosemary and Time. What's going on here? I think I know. And the homicide detectives of Midsummer Murders. Oh, I see. Catch them in action tonight, starting at 8 p.m. on NJTV.